You're listening to the First Corinthians When Immaturity Meets Worldliness series preached by Pastor Rick Dressler at Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We, we skipped last week. We had our Easter service, of course, a glorious time, wonderful time. Uh, just a, a great service where we just exalted our risen Savior. And what a blessing it was through the music, through the scripture, and uh, just a glorious, glorious day. Appreciate that so much. And so two weeks ago, we were in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And the title of that message, if you recall, was the cricket sermon. And it was because the, the topic was heavy and... Um, it's one of those services where, as you listen, uh, there, there's not a lot of fidgeting going on. People are sort of sitting still, uh, almost afraid to move in fear that, that, that they might be recognized or whatever. So um, that was two weeks ago, and we didn't finish Chapter 5. So we're going to finish Chapter 5 today, and I have to tell you, it's going to be kind of like this cricket stuff going on, because it's heavy, it's deep, there's lots happening, and I, and I promise you this morning... There will be something that is said that is going to rub you the wrong way. Don't you love when a service starts out like that? Years ago, John R. Rice was preaching in a church, and he preached a message that was just sort of loud and bold and in your face and called Sin, Sin. And afterwards, a woman came up to him, and she was irate and said, "Uh, Dr. Rice, you rubbed me the wrong way with what you said. And he said, lady, if I rubbed you the wrong way, you need to turn the cat in the other direction. Okay, and I don't know what that meant, but he thought it was a great thing to say. And so, whatever. All right, so here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's just read verses 1 through 8 this morning. We'll review, and then we'll finish off this chapter today. 1 Corinthians 5, starting now at verse number 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And you're puffed up. And if not, rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in the body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And we'll stop here this morning and just sort of review. Um, It's important this morning to remember what this text is dealing with. Paul is dealing with the church And specifically, he is dealing with public, unrepentant sin. And he names it. You you know what it is already. He's dealing with this. And as you read this portion of Scripture, you understand that certainly Paul is concerned with this sin and this man and this behavior. But he's more concerned with the attitude the church has toward this event and their lack of activity. They do nothing about it. And as we worked our way through last week, it was clear that Paul said it is crucial for the church. When we say church, the ecclesia, the called out assembly, those brothers and sisters who are in Christ, they're born again, they are the church. They're the people who have committed themselves to each other in community. And Paul says it's crucial, it's imperative that the church, not only in Corinth, but in Chatham, the church is clear about sin, 
not just we're against it, clear about sin, and has the boldness to deal with it. And and you're going to find that in chapter 5. It's all there. We've talked about that. And we said two weeks ago that when the church acts like the church, and we're clear about sin, and we deal with it, then it's, it's advantageous first for the sinner within the church. And when I say sinner within the church, I mean a brother or sister in Christ who is erring in this situation. And it's good for two reasons. The first is because that brother or sister, they realize that they're in trouble. My friend, we've got to get past this idea that is loving and kind and Christian-like to ignore wicked, sinful, destructive behavior. It is not. It is not. And it's not okay to condone or to make excuses in the lives of the church or in our own individual lives. And so when the church is clear about sin and willing to deal with sin, uh, the, the, the erring brother or sister, they realize that they're in trouble. They're in trouble. And we are in trouble. And so this morning as we think about this, don't just gloss over the own darkness of our own hearts. We need to deal with our own sin. But when the church is clear, they realize, okay, I'm in trouble, and they are. And number two, that it can be remedied. The reason God exposes sin is so that it can be taken care of. It's important to deal with it. And the idea of being clear and dealing with it is so that that brother or sister can be put out so that they're shocked to saying, listen, I miss that fellowship. I miss that church. I want to be made right and get back into fellowship. And so it's, the idea is remedial for them to return. So it's good for the sinner, the erring believer within the church. And we said last week that when the church is clear on sin and will deal with sin, it is good for the saints within the church. It's good for us. Because it reminds us that God wants his church to be pure. Can I tell you something this morning? God is concerned with the purity of his children. All of his children. Let's take a break from the text here. Let's look at uh, Lamentations this morning, uh, chapter 2, if you would. And, and most of us are familiar with Lamentations 3, great verses. We go to them often. It says, it's the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed because his compassions fail not. Uh, they're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. We know those verses. We quote those verses. But you need to know why his mercies are new every morning. Because his people sometimes can be knuckleheads. That's in the context there, right? Because we need his mercy, we need his grace, and he's serious about his children being holy. Look at chapter 2, verse number 14. Let's back up to verse 13. Do we have 13 on the wall? No, 14. Okay, 14 is fine. He says, Thy prophets, your spiritual leaders, talking now to the nation of Israel, have seen vain and foolish things for, the, for thee, and they have not discovered thine iniquities. And what he's saying there is this. Your spiritual leaders are ignoring your spiritual condition. You have problems. You have issues. There are, sin, there are sins that you're practicing, and what they've done is they have ignored those things. They've not discovered your iniquities. And here's why. They're turning you away from captivity. See, the church leaders were not doing the people of Israel a favor by ignoring these things. As they ignored them, the people then went into captivity. They paid for that. Verse 15, and here's what happens now. Because they weren't warned, because they didn't make it right, because they weren't holy before God. All the people that passed by, they clapped their hands, they hissed, they wagged their head at the daughter of Jerusalem saying, this is a city that... Is this the city that men call the perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth? And the idea is it was. But now because of their iniquity and because no one told them and turned them, they were punished. And so it's good for saints in the church. It reminds us the church is supposed to be pure. And when I say the church, I mean you and me. And then it reminds us of the privilege of church. Listen to me. The church is important. It's important. Life in the church is important. 
how we do church is important. And all of us know this morning, when church is done poorly, it is terrible. Isn't it? I mean, we've been there. We've been in churches like, this is terrible. Why go? Why bother? But when it's done right, when the Spirit of God is active in the lives of His people, when there's transforming power happening where men and women and young people are being changed, it truly is a blessing. It is a privilege. And to be put outside of that, then, should be redemptive in its nature. And so, Paul says, when the church is clear on sin, When the church deals with sin, it is good for the sinner within the church, it is good for the saint within the church, and here's the next point, this is the last point, but don't get excited because we're just starting. Here's the last point, that when the church is clear about sin and deals with it, it is good for the sinner outside of these walls. Let's look now at our text, chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians. Look with me, if you would now, at verse number 9. I wrote unto you in the epistle not to keep company with fornicators. And so obviously Paul wrote a letter earlier than this letter, the previous letter. And in the letter he just makes a statement. Hey, listen, don't keep company with, don't communicate with, don't eat with, don't fellowship with fornicators. Pretty straightforward. I mean, I think most of us can understand what he means there. He says, I wrote this letter to you, verse number 10. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if a man that is a, called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or idolater or railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such as one know not to eat. For what? Have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within. But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. And so Paul now gives us the instruction here, and he says, listen, when I wrote that letter to you about fornication, you're a little confused. And so I want to clear up for you what I meant by that. And so now he's going to tell us, who that was meant for, and who it was not meant for, and what we do about it, all right? So let's talk, first of all, who it was not meant for. When Paul said, don't fellowship with fornicators, he said, I'm not talking about the world. I'm not talking about those outside of these walls. And he expands the list to fornicators, covetousness, extortioners, right? He, he expands it. And the reason he says that we're not to... Be, to that, that we can fellowship with them, it's not talking about them, is because if we were not to fellowship with those type of people, we would have to be removed from the world. Because outside of these walls, we, uh, we all know people who are fornicators, they're covetous, they're extortioners. It's the way the world is. And so Paul says, when I wrote that, I was not talking about folks outside of the church because you would have to remove yourself from this planet. And the proof that Paul is right and correct here is that after we got saved, God did not take us off this planet. We're still here. Look, if you would, at the book of John, John chapter 17. This is exactly what Jesus prays in his priestly prayer for his people. John 17, he's praying now, and you're familiar with this verse. He says, verse number 15, I pray not that thou wouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And Jesus says, I'm praying for my own, and what I'm praying for is not that you snatch them out of here and remove them, but that they stay here and that they're isolated or insulated from evil. This is the same thought we find in Matthew chapter 5. You remember that where, where, where Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. Right, And the idea of salt is that it preserves and it enhances. And so he says, you're the salt of the earth, talking to God's people. You are to engage your culture, engage society. And then he says, you're the light of the world. City on a hill can't be hid. And so when Paul says, don't keep company with fornicators, he is not talking about the world. The truth is, we are to engage in our world. 
this is an area where the fundamentalists are partially right and partially wrong. They're right in the idea that we are to be distinct, we are to be light, we are different. But they're wrong in the idea that we're supposed to isolate ourselves from our world. We have to engage. We cannot reach the world by removing ourselves from the world. It's impossible. And we need to be careful about this. We have this idea that the only thing that matters is, you know, Christian service. And we, so, so we have churches now where we, and, and of course, we have our churches. But then we have, and I'm not bashing these things, but listen to me. We have our Christian schools, our Christian day schools, our Christian nurseries and daycare. We have Christian colleges and Christian universities and Christian retreats. And we are never engaging in this world. And we have this idea that all that matters is the pastor and the missionary and the evangelist. Listen to me. God's plan and purpose is that we all are ministering where he has placed us, where you're at, to engage this world, to be salt, to to enhance this life that we live. And so that means in your home. You're doing Christian ministry, man. I just have these kids and they're pulling on my apron. I just never get any rest. Listen to me. Believe me, if anyone's doing Christian ministry, you are. In your home. In your neighborhood. In your places of work. Next to that guy or girl on the line that you think, man, does she kiss her mother with those lips? I mean, she swears like a sailor. Yeah. God has placed you there to be a witness to them. So Paul says, when I said don't keep coming with fornicators, it wasn't that I, that, that I meant those outside the walls. That's, that's the world. And then he says, we are not removed and we are not required to judge them. Now listen to me. I hope you know by now that when we talk about judging in the Bible, we've got to take things in context. Because certainly we all judge. We all make judgment calls. We do it every day. And this is what Paul is judging the church here. Right? When Jesus says, thou shall not judge, or judge not lest you be judged, he's talking about that pharisaical, self-righteous, you put yourself up, right, and you're judging the motives and the, 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 uh, the attitude of a heart. That's not for us. But Paul says here, we, we are not to judge the world. Listen to me. Christians, we take the world as it is. Why are we surprised when the world acts like the world? Uh, listen to me. I, some of you folks, if we were to take our church and go to a big function, right? Let's go, to, let's go to a stadium where there's tons of people. Some of you folks, as you were at a stadium, you would make comments like this. As you're listening and viewing and watching, you'd say something like, um, Oh my, I believe they just cursed. Uh... Yeah, and you're, you're surprised at that? Oh, oh, I think they're drinking alcohol. Isn't she dressed like a floozy? I don't know who even uses those words anymore other than us, right? <laughs> Did you see the tight britches she's wearing? Listen to me. Yeah, britches, I know. Okay, you. Who talks like that? We do, and it's weird. It's the world. That's the way the world is. And we take the world as it is. I don't know about you. Listen to me. When, when I am around people like that, I just sort of feel at home. Honestly, it's like, these are my people, right? And maybe because they remind me of my family and my cousins and my uncles and my aunts. Maybe. But it's okay. And, and Paul says, listen, when I wrote this, I wasn't saying remove yourself from the world, and I wasn't saying judge the world. You're not required to do that. You take the world as it is, and we should not be surprised because that is the life of anyone who leaves truth and hope and life, and they believe that they are free and independent only to become slaves to themselves and sin. And we should remember the pit from whence we've been dug and thank God for it and try to reach people. So Paul says, listen, when I wrote that letter, I want to clear something up. I wasn't talking about outside the walls. I was talking about inside the church. 
Let me, let me give a quote to you that I think helps make the transition here. This is a quote by, by Bruce Winter, and here's what he says. He says, The ease with which the present-day church often passes judgment on the ethical or structural misconduct of the outside community is at times matched only by its reluctance to take action to remedy the ethical conduct of its own members. Let that sink in for a second. Here's what the church is. We're all bent out of shape about what's happening outside of these walls. And we never stop and worry about what's happening inside of this place. And Paul says, that's what I want to deal with. So let's look back at our text now. Verse number 11 of chapter 5. He says, but now have I written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother, a sister in Christ, be a fornicator or a covetous or idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such and one, no, not to eat. Now listen to me. Verse 11, when Paul is talking here now, he is talking about persistent behavior with this list. Because listen to me, we all know this. We as believers, we sin and we fall, and Paul is not talking about struggling through sin. This, this sin that does so easily beset us, that these issues, that, he's not talking about that. He's talking about people here, that this is persistent behavior. It is ongoing. They are persisting in activities in which they have, they have left the lifestyle that they've been freed from. And you're going back to this. That's what he's talking about there. And look what he does. He expands the list there. Paul is convinced that within the church, there should be a distinction from the church and the world. And so he says, if a brother or sister is called a fornicator, there should be a difference among believers and the lost in sexual purity. Or covetous. This is one of those areas that we're really quiet about in our culture because for the last hundred years we've been materialistic. But he says the church should have a different attitude about stuff. The people of God should think about eternal perspectives, not bigger, better, more, keeping up with the Joneses. There should be a distinction. Or idolater, someone who worships anything other than God, a railer, our tongue, the way we speak, a drunkard, being drunk with alcohol, or an extortioner, ripping people off. He says, that's what I'm talking about. So what he's saying is, if this is persistently going on in the church, this is a problem. A problem. And so, within the church, he says, we are required to judge this behavior. Isn't it funny how we're, we're prone to condemn everybody's sin outside of this place and just ignore our own? I have to tell you something. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to say this the wrong way, but I hope you understand what I'm saying. I hate, I think how to say this, I hate, I'm not going to say I hate people who do this, because that wouldn't be the best thing to say, um, but I hate the behavior of people who gossip. I mean, don't you? I mean, you're out in the world, you, you work a job, and you hear people that, you know, the, the, they have power because they know information, they're talking, they're gossiping, they're criticizing, they're always, they're always beating people down with what they say. I personally, I hate that. I hate it. But we allow it in our churches. We come together and under the guise of a prayer request, or I'm really concerned about this person, so let me talk to you about them. We gossip. It's a, and we, we hate it in everyone else, but we accept it in ourselves and others. Um, I, I hate the attitude where people think they're better than somebody. I just I can't stand it. And granted, maybe because I'm a hillbilly, maybe that's why it, it's okay for me. But I just, I, I, don't you know who I am? Don't you see what I have? Don't you know where I've been? Don't you know my educational status? I couldn't care less. But it's a big deal. And it's not scriptural. At the cross, we're all even. But then we come to our churches. Nah, I don't talk to that group. Uh, they're born on the other side of tracks. They're not as educated as I am. Problematic. We hate perversion and wickedness outside these walls. But on our computers the night before we come here, it's okay. That's a problem. It's a problem. And Paul says... I'm not as concerned about what's happening outside these walls as the sin within the walls of the church. Can I tell you something? 
we are in this world. We're not of this world. The church is in this world. We're not of this world. It's okay for a boat to be in the water, but when water gets into a boat, you're in trouble. Several years ago, we, we took a family vacation. It was the worst vacation we ever took, bar none. It was terrible. It was terrible. It, the weather was bad almost the whole time. It rained. The, the, the ocean that we were on was rough and terrible. While we were gone, we got robbed. That's why you don't post stuff on Facebook, all right? You get robbed. It was terrible. And, and we had one decent day, and, and it was a Sunday afternoon, and uh, Dave and Chelsea were down at school, and they called and said, listen, want to get together? They drove three hours to meet us. We had a pontoon boat. We said, we'll take you out, and we went out on the boat. And, and we were driving the boat, and there's this portion in the Gulf where we're at, the Gulf of Mexico there, and there's two sandbars, and in between them they call it Shark Alley. And the reason they call it Shark Alley is because it's deep, um, and sharks are there. That makes sense, right? Shark Alley, it's deep, and sharks are there. So we go through there to fish. And so we have Dave and Chelsea and the boys, just the two at the time, and we're in the boat in the pontoon, and, and this wave comes up. It was one of these rogue waves. I mean, it was, the water was just rolling. And that wave hit the front of the boat. And that pontoon, I'm not kidding you, it shot up out of the water. The, the front dove in. I thought to myself, we're going to kill John and Linda's grandchildren. Okay? They're going to drown out here in Shark Alley. Okay? And that boat just, I mean, it just, nose, it just took a nosedive. Now, pontoons are really hard to sink. Okay? But it, it terrified me. The water was in the boat. And that's problematic. My friend, listen to me. I'm not concerned what's going on out there. I'm concerned what goes on in here first and in here. And Paul says, we are required to judge that. It's important. And not only to judge it, he says to remove it. Look at verse 11. Verse 11, he says, I've written this, look at the end, with, with these folks that are persistently in this behavior within the church, they call themselves a brother or sister in Christ, he says, with such a one, no, not to eat. Don't fellowship, don't keep company, don't encourage, it's don't eat. Verse 13, but them that are without God judgeth, walking about the world, therefore put away from among yourselves that Wicked person. He says, cast them out. Cast them out. Now listen, some of you right now are thinking, um, that sounds really, really harsh. That doesn't sound Christ-like. Is this louder for some reason? Did something change on me? Is anyone paying attention? That, did, what happened? Okay. Do I sound more authoritative now? Good. All right. Okay, I don't know what that's about, but now it sounds better. All right. That's harsh. Why would Paul say that? Listen to me. He's talking about people who, because of the, they, they made a profession of faith in Christ, but now they are deliberately and actively living a life that is contrary to that profession. Paul says, they've got to go. They've already opted out. Their, their testimony doesn't match the church of Jesus Christ. And so he says, you have to let them go. Okay, so, so we have that. So, so here's the deal now. So you said when the church is clear about sin and deals with it, it's good for the sinner, the erring brother or sister within. It's good for the saint within. But how in the world, when the church does this, is it good for those outside of the church? And here's how it's good. Because unbelievers are drawn and attracted to unmistakable distinctiveness. And that's what the church is. The church is to be a striking alternative in the world where we find ourselves, where when people look in, they say, wait a minute, that place is different. That place is serious. That place takes sin seriously. That place deals with it. There's something going on there. They are different. Listen to me. If there's not a distinction with us, we become a walking contradiction because we say as believers, Jesus Christ 
died for my sins. He paid the price. His blood was shed so that I could be delivered from the penalty of my sin. I've been rescued, redeemed, purchased, bought by his blood. And not only that, that blood not only delivers me from the penalty, but the power of sin. I don't have to be the same person anymore. I can be delivered. And when we say we believe that and then go back to our sin, persistent in our sin, we live like the world, what the world says is this. Your Jesus doesn't matter. He doesn't make a difference. You fornicate, we fornicate. You club and party, we club and party. You're critical, we're critical. You're greedy, we're greedy. Apparently, this Jesus you serve doesn't change anything. And that should never, ever be the case. And when the world sees a clear distinctiveness in God's people, it's attractive. They've tried everything else. Oprah doesn't work. Dr. Phil doesn't work. The drugs don't work. The alcohol doesn't work. The immorality doesn't work. Oh, it can clear your mind for a little bit and give you some satisfaction, but in the long run, it is empty and meaningless, and you come up dry over and over again. And so Paul says, the church must be serious about sin. We must deal with sin and do it right. So with that said this morning, let me ask you a simple question. I want you to think now about distinctiveness. I want you to think about the church, the importance of church. Let's just say this morning, we're going to take you as an individual, not with your family, not with your friends, just as an individual, and we're going to put you in a room. And while you're in that room, we invited your family members, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, folks that you grew up with, to come one by one. And as they came in, we said this, listen, here's so-and-so. As you have viewed their life, as you've interacted with them, as you've known them, what do you believe about their church in light of their behavior? And they're just being honest and candid. What would their perception of the church of Jesus Christ be because of you? Would the consensus be, you know, I've known them, I've grown up with them, I work with them, I live with them, and they're fake. They're hypocrites. Oh, yeah, you see them for an hour on Sunday, but i got to tell you something. That's not who they are. I mean, at work, they're the worst, man. With their kids, they're terrible. I mean, you should hear the way they speak. They are just fake. They're hypocrites. And, and we wonder why the church is in disarray today. Would they say that? Or, or would they say this? You know, I, I don't know, but... They got a bunch of rules. Man, they got a ton of rules. It's like a scroll. And it's check this, this, this. They're, man, they're religious. They're not kind. They're religious. They're not loving. They're religious. They couldn't care about anybody else, but they are religious. Uh, those first two, if you're paying attention, are the wrong answers. Okay. Would they say, you know, I, I think they're weird. I, I grew up with them. I knew how they were, and, and they're not the same. I mean, I watched the guy, and he, he respects his wife. He opens the door for her still. Shows love toward her and compassion. He's tender with her. And I've known her, and, man, when I knew her, she cursed like a sailor. And now I hardly ever hear, maybe once or twice, and when it is, she's talking about the pastors of her church. Um, it's not, it's just, right? I know, I know how you, I know, it's all right. Um, but man, there's, I, I watch their kids, and they got, they, they're on top of it, man. They're trying to raise them the right way, and, you know, we had a neighbor, and, and they were sick, and I saw them take a meal down there. And the guy the other day asked me if there's something he could pray about for my family, he would give us crazy information and literature about something called the gospel. I'm trying to 
invite me to church. They're trying to convert me. And those people are, but I got to tell you, I, I don't agree with them, but, but they're not like us. And maybe not in a, a really bad way. It's kind of refreshing to see people who love each other, see people who aren't wrapped up in this world, see people who truly care about the souls of men and women. It's refreshing. When the world looks to the church, what they ought to see is Christ-likeness. That's the purpose. That's the beauty of the church. That's God's design. That's God's plan. That, 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 that's why the church is here. It's the vehicle God uses to glorify himself. And it's not just the building. It's you. It's me. It's all of us. And Paul says that's why the church must, we must, be clear about sin. We must name it. We must proclaim it. We must say, listen, this is contrary to God's way and God's will and God's life. Why? Because all sin, your sin, my sin, it is destructive. Sin always kills. Always. It kills joy. It kills peace. It kills relationships. And someday it will kill us physically. And so we say, stop. Wait. There's more, there's better, there's redemption, there's cleansing, there's a better way to live. It's not a brow beating, that's truth and that's freedom and that's redemption. We must be clear about sin. Sure, is it fun? Absolutely. If it wasn't, we wouldn't do it. I was going to really be painful. Let me stick another needle in my eye because it's like, of course it's fun. For a season. It never delivers what it promises. Never. We could have scores of people stand up and say, I'm telling you, I can testify, it never delivers what it promises. And so we warn people. And then, as a group of believers, we say, wait a minute, this place, it's a privilege. This is God's community here. And brother or sister, we want you to be repentant. We want you to do right. But if you are persistent in this and your profession doesn't match your behavior, we can't have you here because what you're doing is you're causing reproach, not just on this place. Not because you're a bad Baptist. Because of the name of Jesus Christ. And what it means in this community where he's placed us. And so it's important. And so, by the grace of God this morning, listen to me. And and I hope you don't get the idea that Oh, you guys are against, you know, you're just holier than thou. No. If there's anyone that knows that Christians sin, it's Christians. We, we know. But I don't want to stay there. I want to be right. I want to be Christ-like. I want to find repentance and forgiveness and move on from there. I'm not saying that. Because we all stumble. We all struggle. But if someone's persistent in their sin, the church, and not just the, the church has to say, eh, I'm sorry. We're putting you out to shock you so you'll come home. Or we're putting you out to shock you so you realize you were never part of us. You're lost. You're not redeemed. You prayed a prayer. It meant nothing. There was never any change, repentance in your life. Or we put them out, and they don't learn, and they are God's children. He says, I'm going to take you home. You're following things up, man. You're, just, you're coming home. Your flesh will be destroyed. Your spirit will be saved. And so... The church must act like the church. And when the church does, people look within the church from the outside and say, that looks a lot like Christ. I'm going to tell you something. Jesus Christ is always appealing. Always. Let's have a word of prayer this morning.